I grew up in the Arizona Sonoran Desert, in a place with beautiful winters and terrible summers. And I grew up with the dream of one day attending a top college program. When the time came, I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity, and I loved it. I mean, I really loved it. So much so that I pursued a career in academics, and for the next 20 years, I've spent my time in university. So you can imagine that I did not react well when my son, as he was going through the college application process, told me, Dad, what if I don't go to college? You can imagine that this challenged some of my longest held assumptions. However, in time, I started to reflect about this, and I started to challenge those assumptions. I started to challenge things that I never thought I would challenge. The college system started closing in on a thousand years ago in a small city in Italy, in Bologna. And if you were to look at a classroom of the time, a picture if you would, you would see that not that much has, happened, has changed, right? You still see some people not paying attention, <laughs> right? <laughs> it even looks, if you look closely, it looks like someone's texting, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was a great transformation for the first time there was a place where you could go and learn. And if we move a thousand years into the future, we come to the World Wide Web, without a doubt the most successful project in human history. And its impacts are profound if it changed every aspect of our society in ways in which we're still, still trying to understand. And I'll give you here a few data points from a few industry in the medical area. More Americans, 190 million, get advice from WebMD than actually go to the doctor every year. In the civil and the legal profession, more disputes are resolved through eBay's dispute resolution system than civil cases go before the courts in the United States. The Huffington Post, however you may feel about the publication, <laughs> is representative of a new generation of content producers where content was democratized, the ability to publish. All you needed was an interconnect, internet connection and you could publish to the world. And last, in the field of religion, this fun little app here for confession has received the blessing of the Catholic Church, the imprimatur from the Vatican, and it has fun little features like sin tracker, in case that's a challenge for you. <laughs> In the field of education, the first model to break through was the MOOC, the massive open online course. The first course that ran had over 100,000 registrants, more than any university has students today. 10 years later, the platforms combined have close to 60 million enrollments. That's more than double all of the students in the entire university system. But we're just getting started. This model here, the MIT MicroMaster, is a pretty interesting one. But before I tell you about the innovation, let me take a moment here to consider what the, co the current admission process is. If you're going through it, you know how painful it is. If you have kids that have gone through it, you just feel for them, your heart breaks for them. It is ultimately just too hard. And if you look at this criteria, many of us in the faculty say, if we were to apply today, we wouldn't get in. <laughs> but it is precisely because of that how interesting this MicroMasters is. It inverts this model. Everybody gets in. There is no admission decision. You take classes online for scale, along with all the MIT students. And if you stand out, you get invited to common campus, you pay for only one semester, and you get the same degree as everybody else. A couple of weeks ago, I spent some time with the first batch of people admitted through this process. 40 hungry, intelligent students, much like the rest that we have on campus. And they had come from 57 different countries. None of them had to apply. Not only that, they're coming on proven records as opposed to potential. But we're just getting started. This is just simply one of the many models. Another one is the course marketplace, very much like in the writing platforms. Anyone who thinks they have a course that they want to present to the world can. And we're starting to get a new generation of content that is pretty valuable. 
My wife was, current, was recently evaluating real estate programs to learn how to do investments. As she was going through this process, she came across a course that had had 70,000 people take it. It was from a Stanford graduate that had been in the real estate industry for 10 years and had put everything he wished he would have been taught into this course. It had over 100 lectures and it lasted six weeks. My wife took it and at the end of it felt pretty good, like she could start to make decisions in this field. This course only cost $30. Compare that to what we're paying for a master's today. And so this is one of the clear patterns. Faster education, lower cost, more availability as well. Perhaps no other, no other model represents this as much as the boot camps, where people are training from 12 to 16 weeks and going directly into the job market. The output of these last year approached 50% of all the accredited programs in the country on computer science. And so as I went back to my traditional institution and my traditional uh, classroom, I thought about how I could use some of these innovations. And the very first thing that struck me, and I should mention before I describe what I did, is that I teach computation to non-computer scientists. These are the architects, urban planners, business students, and engineering students that come from non-computational fields. And one of the things that had frustrated me for years was the feedback cycle that we had with students. Typically, the first week is an introduction. The week after that, in the semester, we assign some content, give out a homework. That homework comes back. The week after that, the TAs pick it up, grade it, and it's not returned into the following week. A month traditionally goes by before we give feedback. And so I wanted to do something about this. And so what I did, what I started to do was I flipped the classroom. That means I asked the students to watch the videos before they came to class. I also asked them to take a quiz. I wanted to get some feedback even before they showed up in class as to how they understood the concepts. I then, within the class, moved through 30-minute blocks. Three of them, my class is an hour and a half. In the first one, I give a mini lecture where I highlight concepts and touch on things that I notice they were shaky on. After that, I have them write an actual computer program, hands-on keyboards. After that, we have a platform that works on automated assessment in which they can submit and can get feedback during this cycle. And let me tell you, the classroom changed overnight. If I stood in the back of the classroom previously, I would see people surfing the web, I would see people answering emails, uh, not really paying attention and not really engaged. When I made this change, the classroom changed completely. <laughs> it was like a class, uh, quiz environment. Everybody was quiet, everybody was engaged, everybody walked out of the classroom with a clear indication of where they stood. Not only that, from the teaching staff side, we could also pick up the data and the analytics from each of those machines, and we could do interventions if we thought there was something that needed further explanation. I did the exact same thing with examinations. For the longest time, we've given exams where we give people a piece of paper and a pencil to prove that they can program a machine. So instead of doing that, I had them actually program the machine. And in the same way, they had that automated feedback. And let me tell you that the result and the work that these students did after this period, which is about 10 weeks, very close to what we saw with the boot camps, and then applied this in the last four weeks to a project was an output higher than any other I have seen by several degrees. One of the projects was pulling satellite images from one of the big satellites that go around the world to try to detect child slavery in Africa, try to detect the structures that are being used, especially around fishing villages. These are people that 10 weeks earlier had never seen computation or used it in this manner. Another one was processing information from intersections to try to provide higher safety. And there were, the applications were across the board because I let them choose their topics. Another one was trying to verify with crowdsourcing the veracity of birding sightings in a birding community. And, you know, it were a lot of fun and quite exciting. Now, as I thought about the success of this model in my classroom, I thought about how could I take this abroad? 
How could I make it accessible to communities that are underserved? How could I port it to high school? Now, my son was still going through the application process that I mentioned, and he offered to help. And in fact, he started working and porting this content to high school. In one of those lucky coincidences, the largest school system in Mexico invited us down to teach a course to 100, age, uh, to 100 high school age girls. Uh, they were getting pretty poor results at the university level. In, in the largest school system right now, it's less than 10%. And so they were interested in exposing girls at a younger age. As we were flying down <laughs> uh, to, to deliver this course, which was basically my MIT course compressed into a week, going eight to five, Monday through Friday, again, with the <laughs> teenage girls 13 through 17, <laughs> I thought to myself, oh, this is gonna go, this could go really wrong here. <laughs> this is pretty, this, is, this might you know, be pretty scary. I'm happy to say it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my career. I've never met a group that was more engaged, more passionate, more hungry to learn, and that the work that they did, we'd sit together. I took some MIT students down with me as well. We'd sit together at the end of the day and just stare at each other and laugh because we couldn't believe what we were seeing in the classroom. It worked so well, in fact, that we're going back the summer to teach 1,000, and we're coordinating for a national program for next year for 10,000. Yeah. Now, one of the other advantages of all this work that's being done on platforms around the world is that there's a great deal of data that's coming off of these platforms that is enabling a new generation of researchers to identify insights that will accelerate our learning. One of, I'll show you here uh, a few of them. One of them is speaking speed. If I were to poll you and I would ask you, should I speak slower? so you can understand me better? <laughs> or should I speak very, very, very fast? <laughs> uh, you would be about split. Some people think it's better to speak slow, better, and others than it's better to speak fast. Standard is about 150 words per minute. It's actually better, and we know now from the data, to speak fast. Target is about 180 words per minute. How long should I go? Right? <laughs> You've had some of this today. <laughs> and Ted does a pretty good pretty good uh, timing. It should be 7 or 15 minutes. And that doesn't mean you can't go longer. It just means that you have to reset the audience's attention every 7 to 15 minutes. Lastly, and this is one that I find particularly interesting, is that students prefer hand-drawn diagrams to PowerPoint. And the reason they give is that it's slower. They have the opportunity to accompany the instructor in the creation of the diagram, and they have an opportunity to catch on and digest, rather getting the powerful, beautiful PowerPoint. And I know I'm showing you PowerPoint, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so clearly, we're going through a transformation. We're going through a disruption. The negative side of that is something you see in the press quite often, like in the case of this beautiful doctor from New Hampshire who lost her license because her computer skills were not up to par. And in many ways, this has been coming for a long time the legendary grandmaster Kasparov lost to a program by IBM in 1997, Big Blue. But what's less talked about is that the following year, he came back and supported by a basic program, he beat the IBM program, the big machine. And what's even more surprising is that an amateur beat the field with the support of some basic programs. Now, there's a clearly winning combination here, a connected intelligence, a combination of the human technology and education. And to give you an example, the device that you see me wearing there is something that adds a layer of virtual information onto the real world. Medicine schools at the moment are piloting how to teach anatomy with these devices. For the very first time, you don't have to read it off the book. You can interact with it in 3D. You can run simulations. You can look at the skeletal, uh, the circulatory, uh, all the human systems in a way that was never possible before. Think about the acceleration and understanding that this simple device can bring. And so, uh, as I say in my slide, this is not your father's education. <laughs> and I'll call out a few of the things that we've talked about. The very first one is that there's going to be more sources. The traditional cookie cutter will go away. 
It will continue for some time, but there will be the boot camps, there will be the course marketplaces, there will be the innovations that are taking place like the MicroMasters. The other is the reach. The platform is taking all of this content to the furthest reaches of the planet. It doesn't matter if you're in Cambridge or in a favela in Rio or somewhere in Africa, you will be able to take the same content. I mentioned the students from the MicroMasters already come from 50, 57 different nations. The other thing is that it will be very low cost, right? I mentioned the course of my wife was $30. A lot of these platforms, the MOOCs, the MicroMasters, these are free. And last, it will be faster and it will be better. That experimentation that's taking place with the course marketplaces is going to challenge us, right? What do you mean you expect me to spend $100,000 on, <laughs> on a master's when I can take two or three of these courses for a couple hundred dollars, right? And we will be better. We will respond. And so these will provide more opportunity. To close, I'll close the story arc with my son. He came back from Mexico so impacted by the experience that he started a foundation to teach Hispanic girls computational thinking. And throughout the last six months, he has been taking MOOCs, he has been taking boot camps, he has been trying to bring his skills up to where he thinks they need to be. At the same time, he has been fundraising, he has been team building. And in the end, I can see that he can be an academic. But he could also be an entrepreneur. But in the end, it doesn't matter. He's getting a better education than his father did. And if that's the promise for our next generation, we have the opportunity at a better world. Thank you.